this is always the case. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, fantastic. And uh, the purpose of these conversations really is to exchange ideas, concepts, possible scenarios, questions around the tunnel forest, but not only. Uh, to think together how we could collaborate um, locally, but also globally, and to create community, to facilitate creation of communities. And the idea really came when I did, I think, a uh, film screening online. And what happened is Heather was part of this event. And then she emailed me and she said, well, why don't you do this regular thing? And I thought, okay, of course I should do that. Sounds like a really great idea. And it make a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense now when I think back. So these conversations, the way I wanted to structure them, I wanted to share with you the project, the vision of the project, uh, where I am with it, to brainstorm together, to share, but also I felt that the project is growing and it's quite big and it has a lot of layers. And there is a lot of themes that I'm exploring step by step um, from many different perspectives. And I decided it would be really nice to invite uh, one speaker at a time um, who could also share their project and then perhaps we could put around a couple of questions and we could think together we could start thinking together so today i'm really really happy to have with me here artistic duo heather Ackroyd and then harvey who are based currently in uk uh, they work um, internationally and today they're going to share with all of us the project um, Voice Occurrence uh, from 2007, I believe, and it's ongoing project. So it's a con continuous project. And today's theme, so for every one of these conversations, I choose a theme and today's theme is art and continuity. And of course, we can imagine that art um, itself, in itself, is a continuous history. We know history of art and we know all this uh, rich references that it has in terms of continuity and how each artist is building upon what came before. But also I'm interested in kind of throwing straight away this question in how, how art itself creates continuity in tradition and culture, but also how can it be a disruption? How can it be disruptive when needed? And what is the role of art in that sense? And of course, as a absolutely fitting example in that case, is uh, Heather and then your work because this work is really beautiful uh, vision of how um, art can continue but also can continue kind of a mission and so with that we start um, we are going I'm going to talk about the project then we're going to have one breakout room uh, one breakout session when we're going to split and think together and then come back and then um, Heather and Dan are going to share their project and we're going to have second breakout session. So let's see how it goes. Please, let's be patient because it's first time I'm doing these breakout rooms. Um, so to start with, I'm going to share my screen. Um, let me see. Okay, how do I share my screen? <laughs> this is so funny. This, I oh know, I just press on it. Okay, great. Um, so I think you should be able to see my presentation now. Can you see it? Yes, yes. Yeah. fantastic. All right, so I will share with you what Eternal Forest is. So some of you know a bit more than others, but I'll give you, I'll try to give you a little bit of background and a little bit of um, story. So at the moment, as I see it, is is ongoing long-term multidisciplinary project. It's artistic project and uh, the aim of this project is to try to, to, to uh, look at human relationship with forests, biodiversity, time, and the sacred. Um, and the practical implication is uh, to create 1,000 eternal forest sanctuaries 
which are protected forest spaces uh, for humans and for biodiversity, and they are created through art and to protect them for 1,000 years. This project for me really is um, a way of offering uh, of the old growth forest to the future generations. So I imagine this could be a space that we enjoy, but also could be the space that we might never see as a fully fledged real forest. So the future generations will enjoy it. And my question originally that I asked myself as an artist is how can we transform our um, extractive and highly productive relationship with forests and nature and how we can, you know, what, what is coming after it, how can we deepen that relationship? So the picture that you see uh, on the screen is the first, the first attempt to think about what an eternal forest could be. And this work was commissioned last year by a local Portuguese Biennale uh, in Coruche, in the center of the country, very close, not, not so far from Lisbon, but very, very rural. And uh, the whole concept was presented then in 2019. Mm, this, this place is currently being confirmed and we are going to go forward and secure the place as a sanctuary. But I want to take you three years, um, three years back, and I want to tell you a little story how, how, how the project emerged and why I had this motivation. I, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm highly aware about the pervasive deforestation all around the world, all around the globe, but what I did not know is um, the situation in my new home country, Portugal, where I moved three years ago. We moved in 2017 and we saw um, the aftermath of highly destructive fires. And it, basically we were driving through kilometers of land which were scarred by those fires. And these were due to monoculture of eucalyptus, which Portugal grows here for paper production. And um, straight away I decided that I would like to do something with it as an artist. and. My way of uh, working was connecting with communities around the country, but also connecting with, um, connecting with grassroots initiatives uh, and trying to see if, if I could activate a conversation around this with communities. So what I did was very simple. I traveled around uh, one particular area which had a lot of fires and I interviewed people um, which became series of interviews and a film and those conversations also inspired poetry and artworks which you can see on the screen some of some of which you can see here um, what happened then was a little bit of a surprise to me because I did not intend to show the film uh, in many locations but I showed it in over 50 there were over 50 different screenings in Portugal and UK and most of them were organized by myself which meant that I was always facing the audience. And what I kept hearing from the people is uh, people wanted to see solutions for, you know, okay, so we don't grow monocultures, what is the alternative? This is the picture from the film. And um, I, 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 I sat deeply with myself and I felt that for me, this was not really enough to think about the economic value of the forest I, I realized there is much more to that so i decided to go deeper and i decided to explore the inherent uh, value of the forest the intrinsic sorry intrinsic value of the forest which is you know we can't really put the money element on it we can't really put a value on it and so i had this idea what if we created a sanctuary what if we created a space um, which would be protected and which would be a special place for us to uh, enjoy, to contemplate, to have a different kind of experience in nature and with nature, perhaps to co-create with nature. And um, just to give ourselves a bit of a break from thinking always in this economic perspective. And so I applied to um, an art residency in Kourouj, and this is how these a whole journey the other part of the journey started and i want to share with you the story how one eternal forest sanctuary became 1000 um, 
So this is a picture of a tunnel forest experience in Kouroux, where I take people on a silent two hour walk, which was quite scary because everybody told me, well, people are just not gonna be silent for two hours, it's not gonna happen. People like to talk, especially in Portugal. And the revelation was that people actually need this kind of experience. They're craving for it and they, they loved it. Uh, it was done through poetry, through art, through performance. Um, and I realized, well, maybe we could really uh, create permanent spaces. This is a picture of Eternal Forest Manifesto, which is um, a 10 minute poetry piece, more or less. And it's a 22 meter scroll. It's something that if I could share with you, if I could try to explain it's something that I did not write, it happened. So I was just available in the studio and this piece of poetry came through. And um, I also believe uh, since some time that Eternal Forest is actually telling me what to do. It's communicating to me, it's telling me, well, this moment you have to look into that. And this moment you have to go in, into this place and apply to this kind of you know, project. So it's, it's giving me a lot of um, indications of what my next step should be. And I try to keep it as open as possible and follow my intuition. And th this is what happened with the manifesto. And you can listen to this work online. Uh, there is a video, there is voice recording. It is now translated in, it is written in English, translated in Portuguese and French. And my idea is that it might be um, uh, translated in any language where eternal forest sanctuary will appear. This is a small scroll I'm usually uh, taking with me to the forest to read it during initiation, during performance work and during experiences I do. Um, this is an artifact, a book that is kept in Kouroux because this is uh, written for the community of Kouroux and it has poetry, text, uh, calligraphy and photography and this is the map of eternal forest first sanctuary which is probably a 10 kilometer long pass and covers i don't know a few kilometers um, we really need to see but it's it's integrated into a bigger project of municipality so currently we are in discussion um, to create this first project on the land and um, yeah so where we are with this with this work right now where I am is uh, um, I am creating through this kind of conversations and also one-to-one -one conversations um, a series of collaborations I am trying to sense the space uh, what could be the next steps but already emerge collaborations with artists scientists anthropologists reforestation initiatives there are a series of people and organizations that would like to be involved so i'm basically creating a container for this to 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 enable this to happen um, i have created a global team they are not here today there are four people working together two of them are based in portugal one of them is based in australia and our purpose at the moment is to research artistic initiatives that work with forests but also um, um, oh, I'm so sorry. I just realized my video was off. I don't know how this, I think I switched it off at the beginning. Um, so yes, yeah, so we are working together to create a map of sacred sites, which are traditional protected forest groves because they're considered to be sacred sites. Artists and artistic initiatives that work with forests and co-create with nature. Um, and also old growth forests around the world that happen to be protected for some reason so we're trying to understand what are the mechanisms and ways that traditionally and historically people managed to to do this um, and what are the best practices we can learn from that to be able to implement in this project and uh, of course i'm looking for partners uh, to be able to work with already existing reforestation initiatives already existing forest parks and protected forests and as now um, is emerging from my last conversations with Heather with uh, other artists we're basically tr starting to hear and understand there are many more people uh, working with this dimension we are just not yet connected all the dots of course we are very much aware 
of what has been happening in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and all the different waves in the art and we know the names of these this, um, uh, disciplines and these uh, movements in art. Um, but I truly believe now is probably really the moment to, 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 to work locally, actively, and also to connect globally and to create like a visible map of what is already there and to amplify this because this is really the time. Um, so you see some of the pictures of experiences. This was one particular experience I've done in Portugal. And uh, so here I just outlined some of the possible scenarios how anybody can get engaged. Of course, I absolutely, I'm absolutely open and I absolutely love to have one-to-one -one conversation because I'm learning every day a lot of things and I'm having conversations on a weekly basis with many people. If you know where, how I could present this project and talk about it and amplify and reach out, I'm always happy to do that. If you already know, there are some art foundations, reforestation initiatives, existing forest parks um, I can connect to. I'm happy to talk with them. There are ways to support projects as well. There is a lot of ongoing work currently unfunded. Um, I haven't looked into that, just didn't have really time. And if you feel like you would like to partner with Eternal Forest Project, although there is not yet an existing um, container i am an artist and i have it i have team i have local team but it's not yet um there is no organization behind it as such uh we can also think together and talk about that and ultimately there is all the links to to connect and everything is online so i don't want to take too much time for that anymore i think we've hopefully i gave you enough of a kind of background story for us to have some idea and i'm sure you have a lot of questions what i would like to do um, is to propose propose a question myself uh, the question that i've been holding for a long time and i will create this uh, i'll try to create the breakout room rooms several I need to see how many people we are. 24. So what makes sense is, what do you think if I do six? What, what is it? 24? Oh my God, I'm so bad with mathematics. With 25 participants, suddenly. <laughs> okay, let's do five rooms. Let's try to do five. This, this just sounds like... <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much. At the time you said six by four. Yeah, I just saw it's suddenly 20, 25th person. Okay, so the question is... I wrote it today, I was thinking uh, for a while. Um, what, uh, what do you think could be the methods, principles, and various approaches that we could use in this project or in a similar project like that, which could ensure the continuity of the project? Because the project, as I see it, it needs, the forest needs to be protected for 1,000 years. Like, what does it mean for us to protect something for 1,000 years? What does it mean for something like that to continue for 1,000 years? Mm. And continuity, this idea of continuity is at the core of the project. I would really love to think deeper about it. So I would like to kind of invite you into that space to think what could be different scenarios. Maybe we have some really amazing practices from the past maybe you know of some projects that use the kind of continuity principle and the um, long-term principle and what we could learn from them and i would like to invite you to reflect and respond and so we are going to go into breakout rooms until 5 five thirty-five. so you have 10 minutes together and when you enter you can you can just introduce yourselves and yeah, share. And then when we come back, we're going to share here, maybe each person from the group. So I'm going to try to do the breakout room. So please bear with me. Um, okay, so it tells me 24 participants because it doesn't count me. So okay, I'll do six rooms. Fantastic. And then I'll join one of them. All right.
works. So now, how can I do that? Okay. Progress. And I can join one of them. Fantastic. Ah, ah okay. So I'm, no? So those who haven't joined, are you waiting to join? I see it might be that, can you hear me? The, the Rui, Gennaro, Ines, James, Hugo, you didn't join any of the groups, okay? Please join a group. You need to see, there is a pop-up message, so you need to, you need to join, to, to click join. Okay, so Hugo is the last one. Yes, I'm gonna go to the sixth one. Um, <laughs> the last few years, but I'm yes, I'm I'm finishing a PhD on a forester and environmentalist called Richard Saint Bar Baker, and um. I think I met Jenny at the Evolving the Forest event last year at Dartington, which was a really wonderful space to talk about trees in a really broad way. I shared some research I've been doing on a um, three cathedrals of trees, which um, of which there are three in Britain. So there are one in Scotland um, and two not far from London, one in Milton Keynes. Um, and I happen to know Andy Egan, so this is a, so Andy, I could say hi, um, who worked for the organisation that the man I'm doing my PhD on founded. So, yeah, that's me. Andy, what's your, what's your organisation? Andy, you need to un unmute yourself. <clears throat> I can hear you now. Yeah, yeah, so I'm a director of um, the Fellowship of the Trees, which is a new organisation in the UK, uh, which is looking to um, restore and grow sacred forests around the UK. Um, so I'm involved with that. So there's an obvious connection with what Evgeny has tried to do with uh, eternal forests. So I'm looking at exploring that. I've also was recently working with Tree Sisters and was leading on the development of an ethical tree growing code as well. So that's me, quickly. Good. Hi. Deirdre. Hi, yes, my name's Dee Hedden and I work at the University of Glasgow. I'm a professor of theatre studies. I'm writing a book on um, forests and performance. Um, at the moment, uh, what can I say, Camilla is a long process. <laughs> I'm doing the PhD, the next project is just as long. Um, and so I'm really interested in the aspect of performance, really. I have a series of um, books uh, called Performing Landscapes, and um, one of them is Mountains. I haven't written them. One's Mountains, one's Ruins, and I'm writing one for us. Um, so it's quite some way off from being finished. Beautiful. That's, that's perfect, Deirdre. I, I need to talk to you later. <laughs> okay about our, about our project okay, brilliant. Our, our, our living soil because your your name has been mentioned to me today by somebody else ah small world small world it is yeah yeah well i sorry clive, clive adams it doesn't leave it it's left clive, clive off for some reason i might have met you clive in exeter yeah everybody's met me i'm 73 now so you know bit bit by bit you know everyone's met me you know. I renamed you just now <laughs> you you renamed me yes <laughs> oh thank you i didn't know how to do that yes i can uh, do it later <laughs> yeah I, I i used to run center for contemporary art in the natural world which was operating from 2006 to march of this year and um during a lot of that time we were based in the halden forest near Exeter and so that conference that you mentioned at Dartington to mark the 
centenary of the Forestry Commission was my original idea. I, I won't go on too much because I'm, I'm involved in lots of other directions in water and soils and whatever. But just to, just to be really kind of awkward, because that's my job to be awkward. Um, I'm, I'm, re I'm really interested in, in, in sort of cutting trees down. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know? Yeah. That's fine. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to grow all these trees and then they're going to fall down and then there's a few bugs and then they're going to fall on people. And so I'm really interested in the sustainable growing of, of forests to make great architecture and design. Uh, that's, that's, we, we did a project at Howden called Forest Dreaming, which was all about a two year project about what, how we felt about forests in the imagination. But we then fo followed it up with a, a whole series of exhibitions about, you know, tim timber construction, and um, it's it's to to, to me, I, to put it crudely, there's a lot of people who like wandering around forests, and it makes them feel good. And but <laughs> but I'm 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 I you know I'm a little bit on the other side. In that I'd like to see the trees uh, do do. I like them to to use it to use timber as a sustainable sort of resource. Yeah. If I could jump in and say that, I, yeah, I think that's, I think that's it's a really important distinction to make, and it's something that I'm I've been interested in. I think not least in our response to ash dieback is how do we deal with the loss of one of our most productive trees in Britain? Um, for all of the targets on tree planting that exist at the moment, there's none of them take into the fact that there's going to be about a 10 percent loss of tree canopy as a result of just ash dieback alone so in terms of the conversations about what what the material consequences of something like ash dieback are and actually the more nuanced conversation that they actually really kind of present to us it's like how do we deal with the material collateral of death in trees because it's not just life planting is one aspect of it and it's one which makes us feel quite good but there are other parts of the cycle of life and death which i think are really they're always really important to kind of return to and often maybe even before we start talking about giving life to forests is how do we recognize that they are a really complex interaction of life and death you know, the return to the soil of all of that material and so forth. So, yep, that's, that would be my little halfpenny's worth. I want to come back to the question that we've been set, because we've only got a few minutes, I think, which was about continuity in the thousand year project. And I guess I'm interested, I mean, we might hear more, um, from Virginia who's in the room with us just now, but like, um, you know, this sort of um, need for humans to, uh, temporalize forests into very human terms 100 years 300 years 500 years a thousand years it seems quite a human temporal scale i know it's a generational scale that's not my lifetime um but does the forest care that it's a thousand years rather than 1001 year or 1100 years or indeed 600 years um and is that a very sort of temporal human temporal framing around something that's really about human longevity and the survival of our species beyond and um, thinking really about uh, I guess diverse species. Um, I, the continuity question is an interesting one because, of course, that's multi generational, the thousand years. And I suppose I'm thinking of Agnes Dennis's Tree Mountain, um, which was also a thousand year project uh, in which certificates have been issued um, from those who, to those who planted the trees. Um, I don't know if it's a thousand year project, actually. Maybe it's a 400 year project, but it's, it's, it's what, a I think, project I think of continuity. It's three, three or 400 year project. Yeah, I think it might be. It's a thousand trees then for three or four hundred years. Um, there's a sort of sense of continuity there in Katie Patterson's hundred year project, which also issues certificates. And I'm kind of interested in that idea of it feeling like the tree becomes a property if the system of continuity is one in which certificates of ownership um, are handed down. So is it ownership or caretaking, uh, ownership or caretaking ship, uh, custodianship? What's the difference between the artwork as a a uh, painting on the wall that's uh, an object of inheritance um, to the artwork that's uh, 
uh, process of, of passing on responsibilities. So there were some quite interesting questions around there around the economics of arts practice, actually, and cultural practice, and uh, more than perhaps the production of nature and the commerce. These are just some of the things I'm thinking about at the moment. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I think. Yeah, for me, I think um, a big question is whether in talking about eternal forests, are we only defining it in terms of human needs? Um, and are we talking about wider biodiversity and wildlife um, and planetary benefits? Um, and also, I'm interested to know, Evgenia, what are the criteria for an, for an eternal forest? Um, is it essentially... A, is it a managed forest? Is it essentially left to, to grow wild um, with minimal human intervention? Sort of what, uh, what type of uh, species are allowed to be in an eternal forest? Does it have to be locally um, uh, native species? Um, you know, ideally with lo f relatively locally sourced seeds. These are some of the questions I'm sort of. <clears throat> they're almost preliminary questions in a way to the question that you pose. So I apologize for that, but they're the kind of things I'm interested in sort of, you know, are, are we talking about identifying existing forests or woodlands that could qualify and be protected under some kind of 1000 years? You know, how do we look at protecting that land and space? And is there some kind of covenant arrangement? And presumably the legal um, requirements are different from country to country. Um, probably even between England and Scotland, given the audience here. But, you know, globally, there's going to be different, um, you know, issues. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in what what do we define as being an eternal um, forest, um, you know, just, just as a kind of starting point. Yeah, thank you, Andy. This is a really important question. It's very practical. And this is something I'm currently working on with people who we doing eternal forest sanctuary here in the area because it's very practical and we've been we've been asked this question many times and mind you this is a community for, for now it's a community generated project so we still don't have a circle of um, collaborators who are let's say specialists in the specific areas of biodiversity ecology forestry etc um but uh, the way the way for now i see eternal forest is i see it actually much more open than just closing it and saying okay we're only looking for old growth forests and we're going to protect those so of course it would be very easy to do that because it's actually more straightforward which is saying okay we're looking for top biodiversity top old growth and then we're going to protect it and make it into an art project and that's one way of doing that but of course, uh, specifically where I'm located is a lot of degraded land. And in that sense, of course, you know, how long is the piece of string? How, how long and how much needs to be intervention before we can say, well, actually it looks like the ecosystem can come back to its, not, not come back, but can come to some kind of way of regenerating itself. And some parts of land we are looking at, it has really beautiful rate of natural regeneration. So we actually don't need to do much. We just need to, you know, protect, govern, you know, make sure legally everything is set up and community knows about it and people go and visit. So there's this, this, this different approaches, but I have to go back. So because now it's 40, I, I sent everybody message saying, we're gonna go back to the um, so I'm going to leave and then I think I'm going to return everybody, close all rooms. I think I can leave room and then close it. So I'm going to see you back in, yeah? Okay. Thank you. Leave breakout room. Yeah.
I don't see many people returning. Okay, hold on a second. Ah, oh, five seconds. <laughs> okay, I think almost everyone is back. Uh, let me see. No, these people are still coming back. Um, yes. I hope you enjoyed a little bit of extra time. I'm sorry, I had to shift a little bit around because I felt it's just too quick. Introductions is really nice thing and it lets us to get to know each other a bit more. Um, okay, we have 22 people. I don't actually, I can't really see if everybody returned back, but I hope so. I think so. So I would like to in, maybe uh, I would like to invite you to share a little bit what happened in your in in your room, maybe some observations and um, yeah, you whoever would like to speak first, maybe you could just go on. Especially those who are already here. I think there may be a couple of people are still reconnecting. So uh, anybody would like to share what came up and what could be some of the ideas, solutions, questions, of course. You can just unmute yourself and start talking. Jan, would you like to report? Um, our group. Uh, uh, I can if you like, but would you like to, Kathleen? No, uh, I'll go ahead. Um, well, we I mean, there are a number of number of different things that came up. I think we started talking about some indigenous lands uh, and sacred sites uh, and things. Um, I'm trying to think what we covered, but. I think there is, it's land ownership too that is often an issue and I've mentioned there are some sort of of the protection camps around Heathrow where a lot of land has been sold off into very small plots that then that, that creates a, a difficult sort of area to actually reclaim. Um, the, Yeah, I, I think I'm getting on, on to we, with Anthony mentioning uh, nuclear waste sites and how, you know, when people have been looking into how to protect those sort of land areas uh, and whether, you know, filling it with dangerous snakes and actually trying to keep humans out. But obviously that's, you know, if we want to make it somewhere for humans, those sort of things. You know, there's the, the grouse moors up in Scotland, Anthony was saying, where the landowner you know, the local people want to buy it back off him, but he wants some ridiculously huge price for it. So there are, I don't know, is, are there other, what other things were we covering, Kathleen? Um, well, we did discuss the, um, the ownership and the changes of ownership and the fact that a very, very small percentage, for example, um, in England owns um, 80 percent or 90 percent of the land and and uh, so looking at the provenance of the ownership and if we're talking about the forest uh, that uh, Evgenia is, is um, most interested in you know the the current laws in Portugal and the the provenance of the ownership of that that land the, of the of the forest the concerned forest uh, and whether it's a clear title as they would say you know, is it a clear title? Are there other claims by, um, you know, so the equivalent of indigenous people? Uh, because there are the, the, what's going on right now in the United States with Black Lives Matters and all of the cultural issues that are being brought up is the, um, the treaties with the Indians, which were, they were promised certain rights over their land in exchange. Um, with the, the US government many, many moons ago, uh, those treaties were never, many of them were never enacted or greedy uh, tribal leaders 
uh, then gave away mining rights. And so if you look at what are the, the possible claims on that land going for a thousand years, as far as you can know, and as Anthony had brought up, um, um, also establishing something culturally, and it cannot be, in my view, the persistence of a group, because a, a group, an interested body, even something like even Greenpeace, you know, or <laughs> um, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it's going to end. So you have to have something that 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 persists for longer. And the threats that come from global warming as well. I think that's one one thing that we mentioned is that a, a lot of trees they actually have potential to be almost uh, eternal, uh, and it's always an outside thing that will come in and and kill them, whether that's the chainsaw or a pathogen or the changing climate and water tables. And I think and there's something I couldn't remember exactly who, but actually turning a piece of land into an artwork does give it a certain form of protection in a different way. I don't know if Heather can remember who the artist was who has done that with a bit of land. I think he inherited, I think he inherited a farm, Dan, in Canada. And I think he decided the farm and the land and the whole ecology was an artwork. Right. Yeah. And I, I have his name somewhere. But. I've also pasted there's uh, an artist, Jem Finer, who has this long player that is a thousand year continuous musical score that he hopes will continue for a thousand years. Started in December 1999. But. Thank you, thank you so much for sharing. Anybody else from any other group would like to share something that needs to come into the circle? Jane, please. Hi, Hi we did. Oh, Go yeah, on. you carry on. Well, you, well, I'll start and you fill in. Okay, or, yeah. Um, well, we talked about um, the importance of having an interdisciplinary approach and how it was really good to think, you know, with the artists, with lawyers and with, um, different people but then we also talked a bit about um, the idea of story and place and how you and ritual and how that can be much more lasting than maybe a legal approach and how um, it could we even redefine a forest to include small numbers of trees within the urban environment or at least how do we connect with the urban environment in a project like this where lots of people live and who don't have access to forests um, and then we were talking about things like the Camino obviously big pilgrimage um, things which have been going on for years and years and could we do something similar mm. with trees and Tilla did you have anything to add? No I, th I think the pilgrimage was a way forward because we could take people to recognize trees for all different reasons both because of their place in history or because they're age or you know no manner of things and and in in art thank you uh by 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 super synchronicity i've had two conversations already uh, and people who are, who have done camino they said this is this is where along that route it actually can happen why not why i mean people are walking these routes and some of these routes are incredibly hot and incredibly deforested so there is definitely an opportunity there uh, with this i would like to pass to heather and dan and invite them to share their project with us thank you so much Afenia. it's just a real pleasure to meet you i mean all of you it's just fantastic to have this level of conversation and it touches on so many things you know that we've really been exploring over the last 13 years since the inception of um, this project voices acorns um, so i'm just going to go and share the screen now and sort of bring up bring up the images so one moment just go on side view okay um i just okay i'm going to go to the next image as well um, so this is Joseph Boyce, who um, is regarded within the art world as one of the most influential artists of the 20th century. Um, and, uh, you know, as many of you will know, you know, his, he, he really embraced ecology um, and politics and education. In fact, he often said he felt education was his greatest artwork and he created the Free University of Dusseldorf 
And, you know, he was um, a thorn in many people's sides and a huge advocate uh, for the rights of nature without necessarily using that phrase or that terminology, which was still in evolution. Um, he was invited to do a major work for the seventh documenter in 1982 in the German city of Kassel, which happens every seven years. And he said, I no longer wish to be inside the museum or inside the gallery space. I need to be outside. I want to confront the living dynamics. I want to see, I want to see and speak with people, understand the social, the social dynamics, the social state of, um, of difficulty, um, social state of desire to actually have um, nutrients, a nutritious atmosphere. There was a lot of acid rain um, issues um, in the 70s and into the 80s when this piece of work was being made. It was such an audacious piece and he also would wrote about time's thermic machine so that the living tree, um, bearing in mind that some of his trees were probably maybe eight to ten years old when he first planted them in 1982, so some of his trees are, are not even fully grown, they're sort of like middle-aged if that, um, and you can just see this tree at the end. And he basically brought in 7,000 basalt markers about 30 kilometers away from the German city of Kassel. Um, there was a, um, a quarry. So he excavated and this was a, he really wanted the relationship between that very deep, profound time, you know, something being forged in the belly of the earth through fire over millions of years, millions and millions of years, and the tenderness of this tree. We may think actually for a tree to live 300, 400 years is a good lifespan, but actually when we're looking at, you know, those much deeper processes of time, which we are all um, aware of, then actually that was what he was really looking to play at. But importantly, he said, his, his, his kind of call was that our towns and our cities need to be forest-like, that actually we have to make our cities feral, and that trees need to occupy and live with us, amongst us, and the trees, by living amongst us, will also draw in many non-human species. Um, the complexity of trees, you know, the benevolence, the benefaction of trees, um, needs to really, really be recognised. And, and Boyce was a huge advocate for this, and he actually never lived to see the completion of this project. The smaller tree was planted a year after, his, after Joseph Boyce died by his son. So the first tree in 1982, and this tree was planted, I think, in 1987 um, to commemorate his father's death. So Joseph Boyce died at a relatively young age, I think, in his mid-60s. Mid I think he may have died of a lung disease. I'm not completely sure. Um, I, you know, we kind of regard 7,000 Oaks as a very generous artwork. It's there, living and breathing with generations of people. You know, as the children are born and grow through their lives, these trees are making, are growing with them, purifying the air, giving habitat to... Um, you know, to, 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 to multi-species. Um, it just suddenly really, really struck me as an incredibly generous and very inspirational artwork. Also, there was a lot of discussion, um, particularly with regards to climate change and how artists could have an influence. I often heard artists say, we can deal with aesthetics, we can deal with, um, we, can de we can deal with aesthetics, but we cannot affect political change. And, I found this really kind of problematic. And actually I started to think more and more about Joseph Boyce's work because he was also one of the early founder members of the German Green Party. And the German Green Party is actually the most successful and influential party, which actually puts nature um, at a foundational base of how we have to draw our ecologies and our economies of life from. So we collected in 2007, um, well, hundreds of acorns um, caught the train from London over to German city of Kassel, uh, returned to the UK, co-opted a friend's garden. We don't have a garden <laughs> or any land. She was very sweet. She had an idea to grow asparagus that that one's gone out the window. They said it's going to be oak trees. So okay. we planted all these beautiful acorns. So this is the first one with its little radical. So gorgeous. Sorry, I just find it utterly beautiful, just exquisite. And you can see how it's still holding that acorn that's still giving the nutrients to that beautiful developing um, 
sprout this beautiful germinating. So, uh, first leaf was, one thing that we weren't aware of in, in her garden was that she had squirrels that were in trees at the back of the garden. And unfortunately, we did lose uh, an awful lot of acorns at that point. We planted, I think we counted 648 acorns and we just kind of found recycled pots at the garden center. But, you know, I came in a few months later and I noticed all these little dips in the pot and I thought, what's going on here? She said, have some lunch first. And then I went out and I realized that the, the squirrels had had probably one, probably two in three of the, of the, of the acorns. So straight away, you know, the predatory instinct of nature, you know, um, we first showed the trees in 2009 um, for the Center of Urban Built Environment in Manchester for an exhibition called Future Sonic, Two Degrees um, Environment. And um, we also hold, whenever we show these trees, we have these live public discursive events. They tend to be discursive to some extent as opposed to ritual or performative, but there is a shift that's happening now. Um, and we create these in conversations and you can, so we were particularly looking to, to work and to have build up relationships with local community organizations. So actually Manchester has a very wonderful Red Rose Forest community. In fact, there are a number of forest communities set up throughout the UK and particularly within the urban space. Um, many fell by the way over time, but the uh, Manchester still had a very, very good one. Um, and then we spoke with um, Green Street's project officer and Dr. Roland Enos, who's just an incredible scientist, really, really extraordinary. He's now based in the University of Hull. Um, but he was really trying to understand, we know that on a hot, blistering hot day, we seek shade and to sit under the cool of a tree, there is no replacement for it. There is no replacement for it. But how do we measure that? How are we quantifying that? Um, and in fact, the science had not been done, but Roland Ernos and his team of PhD students basically started to put in process all of that research. Um, so just you can see other people were speaking with James Marriott, uh, Marriott brilliant um, artist from Platform in the UK. Really check out Platform. They do phenomenal work, real social activism, education, ecology, multiple thorns in many corporate sides. Brilliant, brilliant work. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the work that um, Roland Enos was doing. And bearing in mind 2007, there was a very influential paper called um, The Chainsaw Massacre. And this was specific, particularly around London. Thousands and thousands of street trees were being culled and cut down for no better reason than somebody saying, oh, the roots are causing substance in my house. Or I don't like the fact that, you know, all of this stuff is dropping down on my car from the lime tree. It was just out of control. And um, there was a huge outcry about it. And there was a huge need to understand how street trees, how trees in the urban space are actually beyond contributing. They are the life force and the pulse of our cities. So he showed very clearly that current climate models predict big changes in the UK over the next 80 years. This is 2007. UK temperatures will rise by four degrees centigrade within 80 years. We could be looking at more than that. We, you know, this is, we know that actually a lot of the science is, is conservative with a small c. Um, so what Roland Enos and his team, sorry, I don't know why this is not moving on. Um, they set up a model, and this was specifically around the Greater Manchester, um, and they showed that the surface temperature of woodland um, uh, could be 12 degrees centigrade cooler at midday than in the city centres. This is sort of like going into the rural space um, as well. So they thought the more trees we have in our cities, the cooler our cities are going to be. Um, I'm going to move through this quite quickly, but okay, the take home take home fact or figure that adding 10% area of trees to city centers cools um, them by four degrees centigrade, climate proofing the city until 2080. Um, sorry, I just need to say, um, beg your pardon. So experimental plots, they put in place experimental plots designed to measure runoff in temperature and nine were built in South Manchester. So here they have, you have the tree, you have the tarmac and they have the grass. So they were doing lots of things around cooling, around water runoff, you know, what's happening around tarmac versus grass versus trees. Actually grass is very good at absorbing surface runoff. So we mustn't ditch the grass in favor of the trees. You know, they all are playing the tarmac, ditch the tarmac. 
Um, and here again, I'm, I'm going to send you this. I, I will get this talk to you. So I'm not going to spend too much trying to go through it. But really, really interesting. I've got reams of paper on it, um, papers on it. If anybody wants more information, I can get that to you. So here we are. The um, so this is the kind of the iconic image. This is post <laughs> poster for Boise's acorns. And wherever we are exhibiting the trees, we always have this print. Um, exhibited somewhere on the wall, on publicity. We stay with it all the time. And again, beautiful essential nature of that nourishing acorn held within the kind of, you know, the radicals, the roots, and this beautiful flourishing um, life form of the tree. We also sell the prints, oh, which has helped given us some, um, some, some income for the project. Um, so we showed them in 2000. Do you want to talk a bit about this, Dan, at the Royal Academy? Yeah, we no, really should. We showed them at the Royal Academy, but it was the winter time. They wanted them in the gallery, but obviously for the health of the trees, we, we had to put them outside. They only had one or two dried leaves left on them. And for some of the time, I think the pots were actually completely frozen solid. But at the same time, we, we did a series of conversations with some incredible people. Uh, the late Polly Higgins, who was a, an amazing, um, well, tree she started i mean yeah she died died last year very very sadly but she was an environmental lawyer and i is it um she start well she started, off, she started off saying that trees have rights she started off with the declaration of tree rights and then that quickly moved on to um a kind of a dec a, a, a declaration of planetary right of nature rights planetary rights and then she moved that to saying, actually, uh, ecocide, you know, large scale devastation, be it the Canadian tar sands, be it um, going in and doing huge incursions into the Congo or into Papua New Guinea or the Brazil or Peru, to cutting down swathes of trees. She says this is fundamentally wrong and that we need to have um, ecocide put in place in the Rome statue as a, as a, as a fifth crime against peace. Um, it was actually originally in the Rome statue, but it, it got removed just just before uh, that, that went through. And I think that was to do with nuclear power, really, and people realizing that they could be in serious trouble if there were leaks, as there have been. So in 2013, we showed them at the um, St. Center for Visual Arts in, in Norwich. Um, and actually, there's a wonderful curator there called Veronica Sukulis, who runs Groundwork, uh, which is in a uh, great, where is it done? It's a great Yarmouth. I believe so. Yeah, she, she's believe. wonderful. She actually was a founder member of, or very early uh, founder member of Friends of the Earth, and she's completely looking at dynamics of nature, artists working in and around ecologies and nature. So she's extraordinary. Um, and again, our considering landscapes. Um, so we, you know, again, we have these wonderful networks and we have these wonderful discussions and, you know, this live research and we, we still hold contact with many of these people. Um, this one was very interesting, Aristoteles Barcelos Bas um, Neto, and he, I think he did the dark side of green, the destruction of the largest transitional forest in the tropic, tropics and the problem of energy, energy generation in central Brazil. This is, you know, kind of cutting down the trees so that people can start to grow um, crops that can be used to fuel cars. So here we are, another kind of waking problem um, that we all have to be incredibly aware of and, and the suffer, uh, you know, the loss is, is the trees. Uh, the trees went on tour in 2015 and this was specifically working with a really wonderful of network, um, Koal and uh, Nature, Addict product, uh, Nature Addicts Projects. And this was specifically um, taking the trees on tour, oh, just to add here, I just want to say this is very important. The trees are now in these specialized air pots, which really ensures a very, very robust and resilient root, root growth of the trees. And the use of very, these are used very, very effectively by many nurseries, by many botanical gardens who are cottoning onto them as well. And actually the trees can grow very well, as long as you make sure they're getting the nutrients and that you know, you're sizing them up as time goes by. This allows us for the, our trees to have this portable and performative aspect, which, I understand some people may have disagreement with or criticism. Very happy to discuss that as we as we as we come through. So the trees did do this road tour um, through six cities, um, and again we built up 
extraordinary networks en route. Um, you know, maybe this was in Bordeaux. We had five or six different partners throughout the city. This is Botanic Garden in Bordeaux, but we also worked with the Public Library. We also worked with the Museum of Ethnography. We worked with the Science Museum. Um, we worked with students and the art schools. We worked with the Museum of Contemporary Art. So we're always creating these networks. This is in Lyon again. We had um, a place called Subsistence. We had a network of five or six um, different um, organizations. And we actually gifted a tree to each city or to each kind of um, uh, artist led gallery, if that was the case, to this is in Nantes, sorry, not in Nantes, Malouz, um, Lyon again. Um, and Versailles as well, we, we had this whole kind of network in Versailles. Um, when we arrived, this was also COP21, Paris was a host of COP21, all eyes on what was happening in Paris because Copenhagen had failed. We're getting into deeper, 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 deeper turbulent water, flooding, fires, you know, things are starting to get incredibly difficult in terms of the climate crisis. I think that was one of the best growing spaces we've had where we grew these living grass drapes for a piece outside the botanic gardens, but they actually, this was in the Arboretum in, in Versailles, they cleared the whole of these two greenhouses for us, but it was very and, lush sea green, seedling grass. And we created the, 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 um, the tree ceremony, and this is um, an evergreen oak, it's a home oak. Um, because of course it keeps its leaves throughout the year, you know, it's kind of photosynthesizing, it's providing a habitat. And we created these very, very sumptuous living, um, living grass carpets, uh, living grass drapes. And uh, the, tree is the, the tree is here presented, the tree is um, the actor, maybe in this much greater um, opera drama around, you know, our, you know, cities under siege. You know, bearing in mind in 2014, Paris, uh, was flooding, the Seine was flooding. I mean, they had to move at lightning speed to get priceless works of art out of the vaults of the Louvre, you know, and then, um, and that was just one of a number of floods that had happened. And then going into these huge, you know, periods of heat waves, um, you know, 2018, which blistering and people can barely breathe. So actually the necessity to absolutely plant everywhere and challenge the possibility that any tree will be cut down for the vector of development. Um, you cannot take down five mature trees and put a handful of small trees. It cannot be acceptable. So we actually then um, kept the trees resting for three years because there, we did lose. We have lost trees. We've lost trees through our ignorance. We've lost trees because at times we have been um, creating a scenario which has served a certain artistic intent and we try every step of the way to look after our trees every step of the way every loss of tree we feel very very strongly um, and sometimes trees have been damaged sometimes trees have been taken um, and actually now our trees have had to stay in London because um, London um, is now, unfortunately, um, every borough in London is now affected, inflicted by oak processionary moth. And it is not possible, if a tree comes into London, it is not possible to take the trees out. Trees are quarantined. Um, so this has caused a lot of problems for the Chelsea Gardens and for any other movement of trees. Um, so the we, oak, sorry, Danny, I carry on. No, we, we had a, a, a nursery that was actually looking after the trees for us. They've been incredibly generous over the years, but they, when the trees were up in London, in the Bloom, Bloomberg Arcade, they had a clean bill of health. And so it became impossible for us to take the trees, trees back to the nursery. Although we do still have some on there that we have to work out moving as well in the quite near future, I believe. So the tree, Boyce's Acorns declared emergency. Dan and I were part of um, a group, a collective, last year, you know, from the broad, from the broad, you know, we, theatre makers, writers, um, uh, performance um, artists, um, we, we basically declared a climate and ecological emergency. And um, I will put up on the chat when we come back, um, please look into this if you're inclined to join it, 
you're become, becoming part of a really, really wonderful and growing movement. We're now over a thousand. We're also a movement within movements as architects declare emergency. And here we worked with a really extraordinary architect called Michael Paulin, Exploration, um, Exploration Architecture. And he is one of the leading architects around biomimicry. And we had to lift the trees up for one reason or other. And, you know, he designed this kind of beautiful network of kind of very, uh, of these sort of design led um, raised platform for the trees. Um, we had a nightmare about weighting the trees down and we ended up with somebody said it looks like calipers. <laughs> I said, well, in a way, the trees, we are declaring, the trees are declaring an emergency. We're in crisis. Uh, you know, trees are in crisis. We're in crisis. These trees are being potentially could get contaminated by oak processionary moth or sudden oak death. You know, um, the pathogens that are happening uh, in our rural space, ashes, we are losing 90 percent at least of our ash trees because of um, ash dieback disease. Um, the leaf borer on the horse chestnut, there's a disease on the sweet chestnut. Um, you know, the limes are still healthy, good, the sycamores are healthy, the hornbeams are, um, but many of our trees are really, really struggling. This is where the story suddenly turns and gets very, very positive, by the way. So we managed to find a, a, a beautiful resolution to our trees. Um, Global Generation have been running these extraordinary temporary gardens in London since 2003, 2004, educational charity and works together with local children and young people, businesses, res residents and families. This one is particularly in Camden and Islington, create healthy, integrated and environmentally responsible communities. And they're connecting to people of all ages um, to nature in the middle of the city. And particularly they want to focus on the development of the whole person, providing practical experiences and support for children and young people to become catalysts for change in their communities. It is très génial. It is beautiful. What Global Generation are doing, our, we have our 52 trees there. I could not be happier that our trees are held in this place. It's extraordinary. And last year, um, right opposite where this story garden is, and this is behind the British Library and the Francis Crick um, Institute. Uh, opposite is the Summer Towns community, um, largely Bangladeshi, uh, of origin um, Bangladeshi many children born here, of course. And um, they have, uh, right, they have um, raised beds and they can come in and grow vegetables and food. And they came, the, uh, families came in and they, Jane Ridderford, who's the kind of founder, just said they just made a beeline for the, for the, for this, we, the trees are arranged as you can see in three concentric circles. So people can tell stories. There's a small little fire where people can make tea. And um, the woman, the mother said, can our children come and sleep in here in their sleeping bags? And uh, she said, she turned around to Jane and said, thank you. Um, we feel safe in here and we can tell our stories. Um, bearing in mind um, that the Bangladeshi community are twice as likely to die from coronavirus or COVID-19. These families, Jane was saying, these families now in Summerstown, literally across the road, some of the families have not left their flats. This can be seven, eight people in a two bedroom flat. And they have not left because they are so at risk. If you're black, if you're Asian, there's a 10 to 12% increase of chance of contracting and dying from this disease. So what Jane and Global Generation are doing is they're making sure as much food is being given out um, they're right next door to a distribution center for, 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 for living live food. And that is going out and word is coming back. And she's trying to set up respite now, particularly also for key workers, for nurses and doctors, other health professionals to come into the garden, to restore, to replenish, and to create stories about where they are and what they're going through. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop now. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. This was so beautiful. Yes. <laughs> uh, I would like to ask uh, Heather and Dan if you have a question to everybody, the question that we could take into our second circle, second cycle of breakout. 
for the next 10 minutes perhaps um, maybe on the subject of art and continuity or maybe you would like to ask everybody something else okay i just thank you so much and thank you so much for listening and sharing i feel quite moved at the moment so i just have to kind of move through this a little bit at the moment um i keep thinking i keep i, I find this phrase is on my mind that i'm in rupture which is so close to being in rapture but i i i know that we're in rupture because of the pandemic um uh, you know when we're, we're not in a state of collapse it's collapsed we are all entering through the threshold and the portal everything everybody's talking everybody who's here this evening sharing this conversation we all know why we're here and what it is that we have to try and do and work together, which is for me as an artist, and actually I found, as I say, I'm in rupture, so bear with me. I actually turned around at the weekend and thought, I'm no longer an artist. I just don't know what that means. I really don't know what it means. Um, because- We really need to question what, what we're doing and maybe the art world needs to question the artists that they're pushing up there, you know, and, and move us away from making, you know, very expensive items to sell to the super wealthy. There needs to be a real shift. Yeah, that's something that um, uh, Gustav Metzger was very much a proponent of, and the um, auto-destructive and auto-creative aspect of what is an artist is very important. But he, you know, he obviously, he did feel there was such a thing as art and artists, but it had, it had to be within the context that's the subject of this gathering. I agree. For me, making art, if I make art, yes, probably it's a position of activism, but actually I think it, 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 it the, the earth, the replen replenishment of soil, the replenishment of, uh, of water. I mean, one of the most under threat um, is natural water. Rivers and lakes are desperately, desperately under threat. We know the squalid state of our oceans, but actual natural water and rivers are in a, in a terrible, terrible dire state. Um, so replenishment, restoration, um, the forests, the bogs, the peat bogs, which are the prima materia, this extraordinary um, presence. Oh, repeat, I'm gonna put some lovely contacts. I'm actually very interested in doing something that actually has a very practical purpose, um, which is evidence gathering. And I would love to make the suggestion that we open up a Google, a shared Google Doc, and possibly a shared WhatsApp, oh. or maybe a shared Google Doc. Um, I would love for everybody to, for this to become evidence gathering. I've already started to put in all of the artists and artworks that I know that I so far have come across of people who artists or people who are dealing with the living um, prima materia, the living forest, and actually their work is, is about the dynamics of life and about replenishment. Um, and I think it's, as you know, um, Afinia was saying earlier, we need to know who's out there. We need to understand what is there. We need to map it. We need to evidence. So to some extent, it's almost like a research and development project. Um, and I think this is very good because I think it's grounding. You know, I love research. I love, I love gathering information and data. I love meeting people. I think to become a really resilient and very effective, to be able to allow the visions that Afenia has, the visions that we all have to really, really thrive and grow, we have to do a lot of foundational work. And I think the foundational work is really understanding what exists, what has existed, and then I think issues around vision, governance, legalities, um, how we can really maintain long-term uh, legacy um, as well, uh, will all start to fall into place. And I think ecologists, any ecologists we're working with, please, let's draw them in too. This is not just about the art, it's about the ecologists. We all have wonderful, wonderful networks. So my, my request, our request is, please can we start to share and perhaps dedicate the next sort of few weeks or, or, or months to, to drawing this together. Because I think we'll find some wonderful connections and I think we'll find some wonderful surprises and discoveries. Thank you so much for this suggestion. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And I personally feel very empowered when I find projects that I can resonate and align with and people I can talk to. And I think we 
can really learn a lot from each other and from each other's experiences and paths and yeah and share this is this is the time for that that's that's how i feel so i totally agree with you so shall we i feel like i have a feeling that uh, there is there is very good energy in this particular room i don't want to kind of put you what was planned before into breakout rooms uh, maybe we could just uh, open uh, for sharing for conversation for questions if anybody has and you could just unmute yourself and and share in the moment that would be great it feels right if you, if you don't mind <laughs> Just, just going to add one tiny little thing that now 120 trees should have been exhibited at Tate Modern because Tate Modern uh, were about to set off a whole program of artist led and cultural sector um, assemblies around the power to change. Hearing artists, hearing cultural sector workers saying this is what we have to do to change. And we were trying to draw in many artists, but it will happen. And I will do what I can to open up this conversation so that we can find that we can have that discussion in somewhere like Tate as well. Okay. Thank you. Who would like to share? Please uh, be courageous. Just unmute yourself and go for it. Oh, uh, well, I'll just share. It's also a plug. Um, there is a film that was done about the 50 years of our work that's out and it will open in BOD. Um, uh, streaming on the 10th of July in the UK. It's called Spaceship Earth and it's being distributed by Dog Wolf in, in the UK. It premiered at Sundance right before the uh, COVID crisis and, um, and it, it's about 50 years of our work, uh, several of you know, in various projects that really, in, in my point of view, all of the projects have an initial impulse of art. And one of them was the Biosphere 2 project, the most public one. But it, it's, the film is about that and about the, some of the interpersonal relationships in, in the group and the evolution. It touches on um, the evolution of projects. It doesn't really explore them, but um, you, it might be interesting if you keep your eyes out as of eyes peeled as of the 10th of July, it's on in the UK, streaming. Uh, Kathleen, do you, have, do you have a link to share with us? Or do we have to I don't know. Um, the, the, um, yeah, I have a link that I can share with you, the announcement that it will be on video on demand. Thank you. But I don't know where. In the, in, um, in the United States, it's on iTunes and Amazon and Hulu. So I assume it will continue because when COVID hit, as we all know, theaters closed and films are not, you can't finance a major film now because you can't get insurance. And that's changing for those people who are in performing arts. We're talking about artists here. It becomes really uh, the, a, a question and also the viewing of films because we've all had the experiences during this COVID crisis of these Zoom meetings and um, virtual connection. Um, so, so our our film was one of the first um, de facto experiments in how to distribute uh, a film just virtually in quarantine. Also, you know, the perfect film to see in in quarantine. But um, I'll I'll send you the link um, about the announcement uh, of it. But I imagine it'll be on Amazon and uh, iTunes and YouTube and Google Play and all of that, at least, maybe Hulu. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you so much for sharing. There is lots of links in the chat, so you could press three dots and save the chat. If you can't save the chat, let me know. I can send it to you later. I know just, how to I, do it already. I just sent a note, note around, but I just would like to emphasize that you, you perhaps should check out the site of the University of the Trees the project that we worked on with Shelley Sachs. Um, Shelley worked with Boyce for a number of years and 
uh, one of the first things that we did when we set up at the Holden Forest was to establish the University of the Trees. That, that, like a lot of people, I think that her important course in social sculpture has now been scrapped. Um, but I know that Shelley is very keen to work with people on continuing the University of the Trees, the so-called instruments yeah. of consciousness that we manufactured, the, the kit, she still has. So yeah. you, can, you can do University of Tr the Trees. I mean, we had a, when we were in the Holden Forest, you know, we did a extraordinary sort of, I mean, we just took the kit and the instruments out into the forest and we found a glade and the, the, the university was established, you know, if, wherever people wanted to. We just put bands around the trees saying University of the Trees and like the university had arrived yeah. on, a, on a wheelbarrow, you know, but we, surely, we, we, we must, you. You must, yeah, you must use that. I, I would just suggest as, as a bit of an old timer, uh, don't try to reinvent the wheel, try to work with some of us old people. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, Clive, we met, we met Shelley almost at the advent of this project because people were saying, you've got to speak with Shelley. And in fact, we didn't include some images. There was, um, you know, I think it was Cambridge University and the St. James's Palace convened at the Science Museum, um, world leading Nobel scientists to say, you know, to come together and say, our planet is in crisis, nature is in crisis. And um, there were four of us, do, there was a number of us doing um, a talk, but Shelley did, Shelley did, um, Shelley did a ritual. Oh, she, she spoke about University of Trees, but I've lost touch with her. So thank you very much for reminding me. And I'll yeah, get if, if, yeah. if you're, if you're, if you, if you can't find her, let me know. I will do that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, is, is, your, that, yeah. is there a link for that, Clive? Yeah, sure. Well, I, uh, I, I have to look up my directory of emails. I don't know how to do it, but it, it's, it, it should be, e it should be easy from the University of the Trees. I think it's up on S, S Sachs or something. Um, I will send you the uh, email. We are friends. I taught at uh, Oxford Brooks um, for a while, so uh, I've got her email. And it's funny because I was going to mention her. <laughs> so I'm glad you did, Clive. And yeah. actually, we met once at Oxford Brooks many years ago. <laughs> right. So Shell is the real business. <laughs> He's the oracle. Yeah. I, I just would like to, um, to say that um, this has been really, really fantastic, wonderful. And, uh, and to congratulate Evgenia because she's amazing. She's done so much work. She's um, um, such a fighter and such uh, a energy, a positive, positive energy, beautiful energy. Um, so uh, I am glad to be here, uh, finally. Uh, and, um, and, and I just would like to say that this this um, meeting has kind of inspired me uh, so much in terms of the possibility of actually having a maybe a um, you know a sequential thing so that you know this gives rise to the next one and the next one like the trees themselves like one thousand. Uh, one one thousand years of trees. One one thousand years of, you know, having having this energy because there is an awful lot of incredible energy here, and and to to give continuity continuity again, uh, starting or, or going to the very beginning of continuity. So that's that's what I'd like to say. Um, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Inesh. Thank you so much. You, I think you commented on continuity really beautifully. 
and this is this is what I would like to see very much how how things can follow each other and how things can grow from one another and continue um, wide and deep and forward and yeah in many directions like nature does. So anybody else would like to intervene at this point? Um, we already six thirty, but I'm aware that maybe someone else would like to share. Perhaps I just mentioned a couple of couple of books, which is was very helpful to me many many years ago, uh, and that's Simon Sharma's Landscape and Memory. Um, the section about forests is is really beautiful and really poetic. I also just reread re um, Richard Maybe's Beach Combings, which is on the very much on the subject of. Uh, managing a forest that you, uh, a wood that you own. Could you, could you put those in the chat actually for us, Clive? Yep. That'd be really helpful just because then we can keep them. Yep. There's a lot of beautiful links flying around and um, yeah, it's, it's great. So um, I'm also going to make sure that the video is shared with you. And I guess with those people who subscribed to this particular event, but they couldn't come, there were 40 people, 45 people who wanted to join us. And, um, and I think, so I will also follow Heather's suggestion to create uh, a document. I can offer to create the basic structure um, and share with all of you. I'll use the emails that I have from you for now. It will take a little bit of time because sharing, However, we can share through emails or we can just make this document uh, shareable and just those who have link, they can contribute and they can read the document. So uh, we, this is something that I think we can do and uh, we can start from here. Um, the next, um, I just want to just say a couple of things. I'm really, really happy to see you all and really happy that you all joined. Uh, many, some new faces and some people I've already spoke to before and um, I would like to continue and the next one will be in one month's time. I need to check the date but I believe it's either, I think it's 23rd of July and um, if we are lucky and if we, if nothing changes, we'll have Jane Ridiford with us uh, who was introduced to me by Heather again. Thank you so much for this beautiful introduction. And uh, she will talk about her project, uh, Global Generation, is that the name of the project, with a little twist of deep time, because that's also her big interest and her big passion, and that is her research, which is not necessarily um, straight away visible in the practical work, like you don't necessarily see it, but this is something that she's very passionate about and it comes through the work ultimately. And this is also the subject I'm very, very interested in. Um, so yes, yeah, so um, for those who still have a question, suggestion, idea, you can please put it in the chat. It's all go gonna be saved. If you want to say a few words, please do, um, I'm here. For those who need to go, Thank you so much. And once again, uh, all the information is online. There's information on my website about the project. I'm also happy to speak personally, of course, if there is any suggestions, ideas, we can have a Zoom call. Uh, otherwise, I'm hoping to see you in one month. And yes, I'm really hoping that we can start collaborating on larger scale, but also continue working and collaborating on local scale. I have an idea, so we'll see how that develops over the next month. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. You can also leave your email if you want. Uh, I, I, of course, I have all of your emails through Eventbrite, which is a really nice thing. But if you want your email to be in the chat so people can uh, contact you straight away, please leave it here. I'll wait until... I will be the last one to go. <laughs> Lovely. Sarah, did you want to say something? It felt like you raised your hand. 
I, I actually didn't, but I thought of saying something before, so I could say it. Please. <laughs> it came up about in our, um, our breakout group. Um, Heather had talked about um, Katie Patterson's Future Library Project. And um, it's a great sounding project. I guess I, I kind of like threw up my uh, like caution hands because um, as you know, I'm doing doctorate on the sentience of trees. And so to think that, I, and I don't know all the details of that project, but to think that those trees are being grown so that they can be cut down in a hundred years, kind of, I think, in a way defeats the purpose, defeats the message because trees are beings with sentience, intelligence, and consciousness, just like us. And that what came out in our discussion was the importance of um, people understanding that they are, uh, they share so much with non-humans, with trees, that um, to understand that deep interconnection is a way for continuity, I think, to carry forward. And that's looking, um, even through perspectives of indigenous knowledge, animism. Um, I came upon this really great um, quote a little while ago that, you know, everything on, on the planet is, has various minerals in it. And in, in a human being, for example, those minerals become age agentic, right? So it's really interesting to start thinking about how deeply interconnected we, we are and also from David Crow, um, this really wonderful idea um, that the you know digestion is basically the release of solar energy, and to to understand how connected we are, um, not only with trees but the communities of non-humans as well. So, just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> Virginia, this has been fantastic. I I wonder if you could send out an email um, just to a broadcast to everyone just one just so we all have each other in one place absolutely that sound? i will do that yes i will do that uh, now that it feels like this is a natural thing to do and we all agree it sounds yeah. great um i just wanted to say sarah i wanted to just say how deeply i resonate with what you said um it is really incredible for me personally, since we met that day when you did your presentation. Yeah, I feel really emotional now because I felt really inspired and super empowered by, by what you managed to transmit. And it was not just your presentation, but it, it was also some really ancient, very, very deep knowledge. And I'm not only talking about the human knowledge, but the non-human knowledge. And I personally, um, yeah, I, I, I am always very open to all kinds of possibilities. And what I want to share with you now is there is an amazing scientist and I'm really hoping to get her on one of these conversations. Her name is Monica Gagliano. I'm sure lots of you heard about her. When I read her book just one month ago, I was, yeah, I was really shaken in a good way because I already... I, I was already so ready to open to these possibilities and I was so happy to see that science is catching up and of course then other other books came through because other people started sharing similar research uh, by by Mancuso I believe I don't remember the first name sorry so it's all about how plants how, how we see plants and plant world and trees and nature completely differently and how we must shift our perspective and i think it's such a it's such a beautiful way to to really invite ourselves to consider what is another way and what what are other possibilities and i think eternal forest for me must open that conversation sooner or later i'm not rushing into it I'm, I'm being also a little bit careful because people need to be ready for this kind of um, opening but i believe that once somebody is ready for that they will be called because the plants and and nature you know different aspects of nature they actually call to us and they can communicate to us once we're ready i'm really I'm really sure about that. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. And the question of ethics 
it's really really there it's it's present thanks Avinia. yeah i also think you were sort of alluding to that too when you were talking about the forest guiding you which i'm very curious about but maybe that's another conversation i don't know yes yes i think so i think um it's just very simple it's not i don't hear the voices but there are dreams of course and i think as as um as uh, humanity co-living with the planet the dream world um this is another discovery of this year specifically i think the dream world is something we are yet to discover how powerful it is and how we can really step into that power and start you know start using it i mean we you don't use it you lose it and i think we kind of think oh you know we just go to sleep and some dreams and then we know symbology sometimes we look into it but it's much more than that and eternal forest has been communicating through through that through through that portal <laughs> and many others but i think it's for me it's about just being with my intuition is just being open just listening and just allowing things to come through and i have to say it's a luxury as well um to be able to just be present in that space but it's it's a good time for that and it's the right time thank you <laughs> Somebody else would like to say something? There's still some people left here listening in, but maybe somebody still would love to share. So, okay, um, I'm going to um, I'm going to name for 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 those who are staying here, people who are actually based in Eritrea and who are working directly on the project is Josian. She is now sitting against some really beautiful background, super rustic garden. Gennaro is on the phone. I know that his connection is not great. He lives in an absolutely beautiful, beautiful, fantastic, magical forest valley. And we always go there to do our forest experiences. And Hugo Domingos, who I think just left, uh, he was also with us. So uh, we currently have uh, eight active people but there are more people always coming and going and joining us and more people get interested and um, um, just to share with you because we are here anyway on a practical level we are taking it step by step we are taking it in a very organic way we are trying not to make those meetings very kind of business-like um, we are we know that we have to ultimately make presentations and videos and go to municipalities and think about the funding for the project and so on and how to get the land or perhaps work with the land that's available and make an agreement with those who are current owners of the land and think about the governance and so on. But um, yeah, we, we're just uh, creating a sense of circle, a sense of communities, a sense of relatedness amongst ourselves. And I think what we're also doing is we're learning actually how things can be done in the level of community. If we are any circle anywhere in the world, how, you know, how to do this, how to emerge a forest sanctuary, which can be anything from four hectares to something a little bit bigger and how to carry on this work and then how to pass it on to others, engage others into this work, engage others into the experiences. and to be very honest with you, the art part in all of that is really small. So in a way, when Heather said, oh, I'm not an artist in that sense, I'm like, yeah, I know I'm an artist. I do my work. It's all now super integrated. But I also feel most of the time, I'm just happy to be, to be doing that just because I don't even know why. Um, so I think art is going to change as we know it and that question that came up earlier you know what is an artist what is art i think it's going to really be we go, it's like a mirror for us and i think it's beautiful to be facing to be facing that question right now because i think it's very powerful for all of artists to you know to ask themselves again you know what is what what is it that i'm in the service of 
um, and what can I do better? How can I be, you know, better with my community, my people, my, my country, my world, my earth and everyone. So, and those who are humans and non-humans as well. So it's, it's um, yeah, I'm grateful for, for this moment. Well, I'm very grateful as well for meeting Kathleen. I haven't seen you in ages. <laughs> Where are you in London, Kathleen? Well, she's in New York. New York. Uh, Kathleen, you need to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Yes. Sorry, could you, could you say that again, please? Are you in New York or in London? I'm in New York. Um, I, was, I came to New York um, at the end of February, early March, and then COVID hit, so I'm still here. <laughs> I was on my way to London, and I'm trying to figure out a way to get there. <laughs> oh, my goodness. How is Johnny doing? Johnny is great. He's, he's on the ranch. Um, we should catch up uh, soonest. Uh, after this, if, if you have time. Um, yeah, he's doing great. He, he's a 91, for those of you who don't know, uh, he's a 91 year old um, visionary behind a Biosphere 2 and such an outrageous human being. Yeah, he's, uh, he's on the ranch, he's happy as a clam, he's reading his Rambo, he's making his little catchment basin dams and flirting with uh, whoever he possibly can, you know. Uh, Johnny, he's doing well. <laughs> well, we'll definitely, we'll, we'll organize a time. We'll find yeah. a time to do a Zoom and catch up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fantastic. Um, I just want to say, Heather and Dan, thank you so much for that work and the presentation. It was really rich to sit with the presentation and the work and your thinking about it and the way that you articulate it, Heather, it's just uh, super forceful in a great way, like very resonant and inspiring and to hear that um, passion of life in the way that you speak, it's, it's fantastic. So thank you guys so much for that work and for being here today. There are a couple of other links that I put in the chat about two projects that relate very much to trees. It's funny, it's funny, I've got, just worth, uh, as far as Portugal goes, it's a little cork oak <laughs> that we, we've been growing. So <laughs> I was looking at the cork oaks in, in your film earlier. And Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, in some ways, Sarah, it is so much more about, I mean, obviously the provenance of the artwork goes back to Joseph Boyce, but it, it, is, it is ultimately about, you know, the focus and the um, the focus and the inquiry is all around the you know the the kind of the intelligence the consciousness of trees. So I'm very interested in the work that you're doing, and I look forward to staying in touch. You know, and seeing, you know, uh, yeah, just just sort of understanding your work and your research. I think it would be fantastic. Um, we were actually part of we ran a program called Earthed at Banff Centre. I know Banff is Banff. I know. Well, I've been there, hundred. I mean, in the sense of, you know, they're closing it down. I didn't hear that. I'm not sure if that's a hundred percent true. Well, not a hundred percent sure. I, I think they, they've furlong, they've put a lot of people. They've got rid of a lot of people, and they have a lot of issues. But I don't think the the bell has sort of finally chimed on it. I I don't think so. Um. Yeah, so, uh, but there were some wonderful artists as well who are part of that program who'd be very interested in your research as well. And oh, your, nice. When yeah. was that? Um, was uh, it that was on it, it's oh. on the Banff website. You can go into Earthed and we actually have, actually something I should share with you, um, Afenia, we've got a, a really wonderful um, book uh, kind of literature, uh, recommendations and articles and books. You know, around all because it's all of this kind of invested subject matter. So thank you. I'll, I'll get that out and see if I can get that. I'd I'd love to see what I'm missing. I have already <laughs> growing library. Some things probably already have, but I would love to see yeah. new things. I'm always picking up new books. I actually wanted to ask you, uh, Heather and Dan, 
Um, because that question, I don't know even how I missed that question earlier when everybody was here, but uh, somehow it came up now. Did you have, a, or do you have, maybe I didn't read it or I didn't hear it from you. Do you have an idea ultimately where the trees are going? Where are they going to be planted? Um, you know, it, it's almost like, no. And if, in fact, I've, I've always felt it's very have to be really really open so it's kind of living with the trees and being part of their journey and that that sudden shift last year because of the oak processionary moth has shifted everything and the big decision is do we split our trees this community of trees they've always been growing together um, and still keep some so that the other trees can still have a visibility and an interactiveness through discussions and artworks or however exhibitions um, outside of the contaminated zones or do we bring them all into London and actually with Tate, Tate would have meant we would have brought them all into London and Jane was going to look after them between the story garden and the paper garden when their trees were resting but of course with Covid that has shifted again so it's really interesting but no I there's not, we don't have an overarching, this is what's going to happen. I think what we've always wanted happening? to leave it, leave it really open because, you know, the trees, they're, they're living entities and they almost, they the story is being dictated by what is happening around them. I mean, although there's part of me that feels that actually, you know, they, they really do need to come out of pots at some time and get into the earth, but the air pots are very good and we do repot them you know every, every few years so they're at the moment they're being well looked after but and it's really quite nice having that movability that they have because then that as a catalyst for conversations and things makes a lot of sense but but i feel very happy with the with the with the with the, with the, with the global generation and all of the work that's happening there and i, I definitely want to become more involved um, you know in terms of that dynamic and particularly working with these young you know younger children and younger people you know this kind of hopefully a, a kind of generation of people who will carry nature you know as as a torch for how we have to start to negotiate um cities and a, and um a, um a planet in crisis yeah so we'll see we could add well, writing, well, itself, uh, writing itself the trees are writing it yeah, you <laughs> and, could actually and the big picture speak with them and ask them what they want yeah well that was i was going to say that <laughs> why don't you ask them <laughs> yeah, no, well the thing is is that we lean into them i mean you know they know the, the you know the trees uh, you know they they know that we're doing our best as innocents and sometimes we are a bit cack handed <laughs> you know we're trying our best but we're learning you know and and um you know that there, there have been losses just for all different reasons, um, as you would get losses out in the field, any tree you know that might may grow, um, I we lean into them and we we certainly trust uh, the wisdom that comes through that. Yeah. So I, I, want, yeah. I wanted to ask Heather the the last was it Jean Lousseau um, who wrote a paper about trees that we met when we were in Paris. Who? Um, the was it Jeanne Lousseau or a name like that? I can't remember her name. Who wrote the paper about trees and the digestive Anne, system? Anne Jalouseau. Yeah. Anne Jalouseau. Do do we still have that paper? Because I think Sarah. I don't know. If Sarah knows her, but I think there's a. I need to get in touch with Anne again. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know if I. I probably have the paper down on one of the um, uh, hard drives somewhere. Yeah, no, we, we lost a lot of stuff our computers crashed so but, yeah. Yeah. thanks for thinking of that dan i would be curious to see um, that um i also want to say just, i do have some stuff you'd be very interested in sarah uh, from a, a wonderful science colleague of ours he did a lot of work around senescence and he and he just did a talk a presentation at um kew gardens about three years ago with a, a very leading a uh, French philosopher, uh, very leading French philosopher, writer. And I, I, I was gutted I couldn't go, but um, Sid just gave us his PowerPoint, you know, and I could certainly pass that to you. Yeah, it's about the, it's about the immortality of trees. 
oh my gosh, that, that would be amazing. It's Professor Howard Thomas from what yeah. was Liga. Uh, that sounds Liga. amazing. Um, I, I, yeah. I um, I'll just see, uh, yeah. I mean, in fact, there's a, whole, there's a whole project that I really would love to do around this. It's just, I think we're so, we get caught up in the seizure at the moment. You know, we're definitely in the midst of the crisis. I often feel I'm in the eye of the storm. Mm -hmm. And finding it very, you know, which is why when I use that being in, um, being in rupture, in turbulence, you know, I really feel like I'm being flung around at the moment. Um, partly because we're doing a lot of work with Culture Declares Emergency mm -hmm. and that more meditative research work. I mean, I am just would love to just be, um, you know, uh, a few weeks just with the books. I'm trying to put that in place to do the reading and the research and really think about it. You need to come to Portugal and do a mini art residency here. Well, <laughs> the luxury of sitting and reading and walking around. No, I seriously, <laughs> may, I, I seriously may do that because things are shifting. And, I, you know, the thought of doing that, um, and it will be slow travel now, no more flying. <laughs> Who's going? Kathleen, are you leaving? Kathleen is leaving. It's really yes, good uh, to thank see you. you. Good thank to see you. you too, and thank you so, so much for organizing this. I'm, I'm pleased and honored to meet everyone, and I, I look forward to being in touch and seeing how this grows like a tree. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for being Lovely with us. Lovely to see you, Kathleen. Hi, Kathleen. Bye. Bye. Until soon. What a surprise. What a delight to see Kathleen. Yeah, I didn't know she was here until we ended up in the chat room, just me and her to start with. So, yeah, it's uh, interesting how you meet some people and then they re-emerge after some time. It's beautiful. Yeah. Really? I literally met Kathleen once in London. We met twice in, in total. And yeah, <laughs> surprise. Because I've got the whole forest on Costa Rica. Yeah, no, she's still, that's still ongoing. I mean, she, there are a lot of things that they're doing. Yeah, they've planted millions, of, you know, hundreds of thousands of trees in Costa Rica from going back 20 odd years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is another thing to 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 bring those projects to the light and somehow to really map this. Yeah, we yeah. we keep going back to this theme because there's so much out there and there's so many beautiful and. You know, we add to this the traditional sacred groves and the, you know, the uh, yeah. indigenous places and those amazing created by humans cathedrals and, you know, all the different things that artists are trying to create and communities are trying to create. And yeah, there is lots of places that actually are, um, are in real danger. Those sacred groves of India, for example, they are, yeah, they're disappearing quite fast. Yeah, we, we did some work on that back in about 2009 with a really wonderful um, scientist at um, the Environmental Change Institute in Oxford. Um, and he gave me quite a bit of material, he gave us quite a bit of material on um, sacred groves in India. Um, I need to find all this material again. I just need to organize it. But I'm not sure where he is now, but he's wonderful. Do you remember we went to the forest down where they're doing Yeah, no, I do, I do, yeah. Um, I mean, it's just... Kind of like we've just kind of touched touched top of a lot, a lot of the research here. Yeah. Well. I would like to do one of these conversations specifically on um, yeah bringing to the light that discussion around the sacredness, generally sacredness of nature, but specifically uh, those forests um, that are considered to be sacred yeah. somehow. Um, and bring together a few examples and bring somebody who can really, you know, kind of round up uh, in a really nice way and really propose, you know, yeah. that this is, this is something that we need to think about and consider and learn from that because there are lots of great examples how these places managed to stay and survive through centuries and centuries. Yeah. And there are many examples where the land around those places is completely like there's nothing there there's no forest i mean one of the one of the best examples is i think um churches churches in africa which yeah. are just basically a wall around the forest so it's just one example but there are many more um, I, I mean africa as well has a lot um his name is yavinda it's coming back to me now um, um I, I think i've got him on the other on the other one but also we have a lovely friend called rani elsa nanayaka 
and he's based in Sri Lanka. And in, um, he set up the analog forest in the 1980s, which is so inspirational and that's been taken up throughout South America. And also in 2003, we set up um, Rainforest Alliance and they, mm -hmm. they will buy land in perpetuity and protect it. And they know how to keep the long, long-term legacy. So he would be a really- Very interesting. Person. What's his name? Ranil Senanayaka. He's a, as a professor in um, a, a systems ecology. Uh -huh. And he writes a lot as well. He's in his 70s. Oh, he's just fantastic. Um, it's very hard to get his name. Maybe you could try to put it in the yeah, chat. I'll write it down. At least, it's yeah. It's um, a long time we'll to learn how to say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult. Uh, it's, um, professor, oh, so it's Ranil Senanayaka. Um, I've and it's analog for you want to look you want to look into analog forestry analog forestry um and uh, and it's actually international analog forestry but that, that's mm -hmm. there's another zoom event that is starting now that okay uh, I, i've i've just put in into the chat which is um i think that's gone about indigenous voices listening for tomorrow uh, oh, beautiful! So, it's New York. Yeah, it's in New York. Does that? Um, yeah, that's culture. That's um, yeah, yeah. Does that know. come through? Yeah, I'm not going to be able to do it. I actually have to go, so I have to say. Me too. But I wanted to say thank you so much for instigating this. Uh, what we have now, it somehow just was meant to happen. And thank you so much for being. The first ones and oh. hopefully hopefully it's a really good start i mean i i feel it's a really good start and oh, yeah i'm yeah. looking i'm looking forward to continuing and i'm looking forward to how we can really start building something bigger and joining forces and thank well, you so much for your wonderful presentation it was it was great it was great to hear once again and learn new things Oh, I mean, what we will be able to do, and we were just so congested with things this week and the last two weeks. I mean, I've, it's been a little bit all overwhelming. But things are going to get calmer, and I will definitely put a reach out to five to ten friends who would really enjoy this, um, who are, again, working with the dynamics of trees and forest as well. So Thank you. I'll put word out as well. Thank but you. It was wonderful. a pleasure. There's just so many wonderful people to meet this evening. So thank you so much for your, for your generosity and just, you know, your lovely friends. <laughs> Uh, no, it's been it's been a real pleasure, really inspiring. Yeah, Thank great. you. Obrigada. <laughs> goodbye, goodbye, Tila. Goodbye, everybody. Uh, goodbye, everybody. Bye. Goodbye. 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 Until Take soon. Care. Thank you. Uh, Welcome to Safe Chat. I'm just making sure of Safe <laughs> Chat. Safe Chat. Yeah, there we go. Great.